Brothers and sisters all around this world, this is a very special broadcast entitled What's Happening to Our Homeless? James C. Horick is my good friend. He's going to host with Gary Hendershot for right now. If you have any information about this that can be verified, please call one seven seven five six five seven five nine seven three. James, you have the spotlight, the soapbox, and the mic. Thank you. I think we are used to seeing trends of this magnitude possessed of a lot of disinformation, and the disappearing homeless is no exception. If there is a stand, if there is a time to take a stand against the treasonous actions of this regime right now, against the depositioning of these homeless people in America. That would be the best time because you would have every facet of righteousness on your side. We need to stand up for these people because they're human beings just like us, and it wouldn't take very much for almost any of us to be in the same position they're in. If you go online, just type in in any search engine, disappearing homeless and you will get a multitude of links. All of these links pertain to local jurisdictions taking actions and measures against the homeless, even going so far as decreeing homelessness to be illicit, illegal, a crime, trying to move these people out of the area, trying to dispossess them of what little abodes that they have erected on public lands and elsewhere. And the growing suspicion is that these people are being invited as an effect of being even more desperate by these actions or being invited to be moved with the promise of food and shelter elsewhere. Now, trying to track down where these elsewheres are suggests that this might be the early stage of using FEMA camps, which is just another word for detention center for these people. This is an unsavory truth that we know exists, that they're there, and that they harbor all sorts of accommodations. This is in keeping with the trends that have been set to more or less militarize them and to place armed guards to prevent homeless people that have committed no crime that are just there trying to survive, in some cases by the skin of their teeth, from the freedom of movement that they are guaranteed by the only social contract we have with these policy makers, and that's the Constitution of the United States of America. And I remind everyone that if they have sworn oaths in their oath of office to support the Constitution, their authority depends on that. They abolish the tenets of the Constitution and the freedoms that we enjoy guaranteed by the Constitution, they have abolished their authority over us. And in, despite any erection that they make to the contrary, that's the absolute truth. Gary, do you have any idea about how to try to reach people for more and more information so that we might be able to verify some of these reports these links are giving us? Well, the problem is right now all we've really got is rumors you know so what we're looking for is we're looking for confirmation it's almost like we're looking for an edward snowden to come forward some insider who you know knows exactly what's going on we're looking for that person to find their conscience and grow a pair and tell us what's really going on i mean right now all we really know for sure is that certain municipalities for example it's real popular in hawaii right now to buy a homeless person a ticket back back to the mainland and wash your hands of them good for hawaii you know they they have your one-time fee and, and they're rid of the problem they put it on somebody else we know that columbia south carolina has passed a city ordinance basically to restrict panhandling in the business district now you know if i was a small business owner in in the business district of that city i would probably applaud the effort you know if it's going to cause my business activity problems because i got panhandlers hanging out in front of my business establishment scaring away my trade i would probably be congratulating the city fathers for passing such an ordinance 
it's easy to come down hard on the business community when, in fact, they're trying to protect their business, their livelihoods, the livelihoods of the people that they employ. But, you know, a lot of what we're seeing that we can verify is that everybody wants to make the homeless somebody else's problem. Move it someplace where I don't have to look at it so it doesn't offend me, so it's not in my face. As long as I don't have to see it, it's not a problem. And I would agree with you that it's probably just one more step from that to just, you know, eliminate the problem entirely. We got this X camp out in the desert here where we used to hold Japanese during World War II. Let's just put the problem there so nobody has to be offended by it. Anyway, that's my take on it right now. Right now, we have no definite information that there's any skullduggery going on here. It's just simply a matter of municipalities wanting to move the problem to some place where they can't see it. Well, then again, this is done under the veil of secrecy or we know more about it. And any time that in the past, when there have been dislocations of people, whether it was in post-revolution Russia, whether it was under the Third Reich of Germany before World War II, This sort of activity, when practiced in secret and when local policy submits to it, has always led to some form of genocide. This may not be any exception. One of the things that smacks of my worst suspicions, that bolsters my worst suspicions, is that there are towns, municipalities, where laws are being enacted to make it a crime to feed the homeless. This is outrageous, and this would operate to make these people even more desperate and even more willing to be shuffled around to who knows where, and potentially a FEMA death camp. Let's say it. Let's say that these camps have a reason to be buying a billion and a half hollow point bullets. This has been on several mass media documentaries about the police taking genocidal action against young boys that lived off of the trash heaps in Rio de Janeiro, killing them. There was no number given because probably they'd have the same problem here. These people don't comply with consensus. They wouldn't be on any list to have no address, so it would be easy for paramilitary forces to take actions like that. And in the case of what happened in Brazil, it's established they did. So if this is raising its ugly head here, we have the symptoms that these people are being placed, incarcerated, having committed no crime, And this is be an excellent prelude for Agenda 21 and the New World Order's professed intent towards depopulation. This would be the weakest group, the group that they could use experimentally to grease the wheels of these FEMA camps that they intend to dispose of human beings in and get away with it. So if that is what's going on, we need to get to the bottom of it And anything, any information that we can get to verify this one way or the other. Of course, we'd all rather believe that this was not a resort to genocide in the making, but I'm not so sure it isn't. The administration, you know, our government officials, as they like to be called nowadays, I'm old enough to remember when they used to be considered public servants, so I still choke on the words a little bit. Uh, yes. But our government officials are patting themselves on the back because statistically the, the homeless count in the United States is down about 150,000. Just before Obama's last election, I think about 2005-ish or so, there were statistics polled and there was about three quarters of a million homeless. At least there were three quarters of a million that they could count. Now, you know, they're patting themselves on the back because, you know, there's only 600 and some thousand, and they consider that to be a major victory. Now, their explanation is that all these new progressive programs where they got the Section 8 vouchers and the food stamps and all the various government programs are providing the safety net that's getting these people at least into a reasonably comfortable abode where they can live safely and comfortably and they're just absolutely patting themselves on the back over this now it does seem to be democrat republican i mean i'm not a big fan of either of the 
political parties. As far as I'm concerned, it's a choice between poo-poo and doo-doo. But it does seem to be that the homeless all stream out of the woodwork when a Republican comes into office, but they're all neat and tidy and comfortable when we have a Democratic administration. Now, I, I don't know the facts in this. I read the material that's published on both sides, and of course, anything that's published by my government, I am immediately suspicious of, but I'm still looking for some evidence, some little hint of evidence that there's some skullduggery going on here. So far, we've got no confirmed reports that these people are being rounded up and put into camps. We've got no confirmed evidence that they're being let out into the desert and just left there to be found a thousand years from now by archaeologists who are going to wonder why the heck these people all seem to die of malnutrition out in the middle of the desert. We're not finding evidence of that. And I'm just wondering, am I missing it? Am I not seeing it? Or is it there and I'm just too blind to see? Well, we have the people disappearing. That's a fact. That's we're talking, been going on for a long time. Yeah, but we're talking about 200,000 people. <laughs> that is epidemic loss. And there's got to be an explanation for it. And that there is not an explanation proffered by anyone is what sticks in my craw, as well as the desperation that's being forced on these people illegally. We have pundits coming straight from think tanks in this country that have published for the last 30 years what a wonderful thing depopulation would be, not just the United States, but worldwide. This is a fact. When the Gulf of Mexico crisis was at its worst and people were beginning to suffer from breathing the Corexit that was coming in from the ocean breeze in the Atlantic side of Florida, at a military base just south of Fort Lauderdale, were tens of thousands of U.N. vans out on the runway. You could use Earthlink or Google Earth and see them. So (laughs) we started talking about a false flag and that this would be an impetus and a ruse for gathering people up for their own good and hauling them off to these camps. Well, it's definitely an information blackout. We have all these people that are missing that are disappearing. We have uh, homeless that are being moved around the country, and no one's able to determine exactly where they're being moved to, but we know they're being moved. We have reports of them being put in camps that are guarded. We have all kinds of reports that are coming in, and we know that FEMA has been storing weapons and guns and these hollow cavity bullets that have no tactical use. They're for killing people that are unarmed at close range, They will not penetrate a vest. So what are they storing a billion and a half of these bullets for? This is a question that nobody's answering. And, of course, we know it's going on. They're requisitioning this. At first, I thought it might be just to keep patriots from being able to buy ammo. But no, I don't think so anymore. And it's not just FEMA, but it's other agencies of the government, too. Agencies of the government that have never armed their people before. So something is in the wind. We have more and more discussions and even a bill before Congress that's tentative to what would happen if martial law was declared and every other word is classified. If it had any service for the public welfare, it, it would be guilty of being highly ineffectual. There are people that have been told that they would get trailers, that they would get housing in emergency situations, and FEMA is always the last people to pull up too late with trailers that they can't set up with one thing after another because that's not their intention. That's not their priority. Their priority is to set these camps up and administer them. These camps have barbed wire, razor wire, and they have guard towers, We have seen pictures of them. We know they're there. What are they there for if they're not detention camps? Many of the homeless are in that situation because of the deindustrialization of the formerly industrial nations, like the United States and England, for instance. The jobs have gone with that. And what jobs that people can turn to and get in a pinch don't pay enough, don't give a living wage. So you have people that are on the verge of being homeless and might be working. And this, (laughs) 
What about these people that have work but have no home? Are they going to fall in between the cracks the same way these others are doing? This is outrageous. You can look at it any number of ways, but there's no good way that you can find to look at this because these people are not being given any guarantees that they're going to improve their situation by being shuffled around. In fact, it might lead to their demise. With all the vaccinations and different kinds of biological weapons and everything else that people are beginning to realize that our government and military have developed, you have to wonder how many of these flu epidemics are created just for purposes like this. What do you think, Gary? Well, I'm, I'm sort of taking it in. It's, um, you know, I, I probably got as conspiratorial a line of thinking as anybody out there. And, and, and to be honest with you, I've, I've been in this fight since the 1960s. I mean, for crying out loud, I, you know, I had a ponytail, a Harley, and I was burning my draft card back in 1969. Do you remember a report uh, from Iron Mountain? Oh, yeah, I remember that. And I remember the Gulf of Tonkin incident. I remember thinking if they launch those darn missiles from Cuba, I've got 90 seconds to try and kiss my butt goodbye. I mean, you know, <laughs> we, we lived through some crazy times. There were a lot of us back in those days who I'm sure would have qualified with the moniker of hobo or vagrant or whatever. I mean, I guess I was probably in that group for eh, Were you 10 a years. Oh, Were you God, a hippie? I was a little bit of a crazy-sided hippie because most people today would have considered me a motorcycle gangster. They would not even bless me with the more benign term hippie. They would have considered me a hell's angel, although I was, alone, I, was, yeah, I was a lone wolf. I wouldn't want to belong to a club that would have me as a member, so I didn't join any motorcycle gangs. But I was out there on the road. I'd sleep by the side of the highway, and I'd follow the Grateful Dead all over the country. I lived that lifestyle for about 10 years. I'd take work when I needed it, shunned work when I didn't need it. The, the idea of having a job always offended me and still to this day offends me my wife will tell you that i have been unemployed for 37 years and you're a free spirit <laughs> yes and so you know that the idea of somebody being homeless because they don't have a job i kind of scratch my head about that but i understand there, there are folks out there through no fault of their own have fallen through the cracks i feel particularly bad about the veterans Yes. You know, they, they put their butts on the line. Whether you liked the war they fought or not, in their mind, they were serving the country. They were doing the honorable thing. They put their butt on the line thinking they were doing what was right for the nation. Whether you believe the war they fought was honorable or not, it doesn't matter. In their mind, they served their nation. They did the right thing. And we've tossed them on the trash heap. And I understand right now there's, I don't know, 130, 150,000 of those guys uh, who, are, who are wandering the streets, you know, with not enough to eat. Now, that doesn't mean if I'm the guy who owns the local chicken joint, that doesn't mean I want them standing out in front of my chicken joint panhandling. Now, if they come to the back door and knock on it and say, hey, man, I ain't eating in a couple of days, I guarantee you I've got some chicken for them, Okay. I Unless just don't the police want arrested you for feeding them. Well, you know, the police don't have to know, okay? I mean, a law like that is illegal. It sure care. is. It a sure law is. like that is illegal. You cannot pass a law that tells me I can't help somebody out if I so choose. You should not pass a law that says I have to help somebody out. How many of these social laws have been put into action and enforced that are unconstitutional, hence illegal? The problem is, this is nothing new. This has been going on ever since I can remember. There were towns I was thrown out of because I was a long-haired, heapy, freaky-looking person riding a Harley. And we just don't care for your kind around here, boy. Hit the road. Okay? I mean, I heard that a lot. And, you know, I'd shrug my shoulders, I'd hop on my motorcycle, and I'd go to the next town. You know, I'd find a job washing dishes or whatever, get enough money to buy my gasoline, and I'd be on my way. This is nothing new. There's always been that Sheriff Buford T. Justice who wasn't going to have your kind in his town. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has always, always 
It's becoming endemic and it's becoming approved by these mayors and councilmen in municipalities all across the country who decided that these people need to be rounded up and moved out of their jurisdiction. They don't care how it's done. They don't care where these people go. They don't care what fate befalls them. That's criminal. What is the proper solution? It's got to satisfy all the constituencies. You've got your small businessman who doesn't want this guy standing out in front of his business panhandling. Okay, that to the small businessman is offensive. All right, so we've got to satisfy that constituency. The guy doing the panhandling just wants a meal for the day. He'd like to have a safe, clean, comfortable place to sleep at night. How do we solve this problem well, uh, without raping all, and pillaging yet more from the middle class who can't afford it? It's not that the problem isn't without a solution. It's that everything that has been dealt these people is to make it worse for them. I can remember here in Fort Worth, where I live, that there was low-cost rental property, apartments downtown. And these people could get together and they could have an apartment and could afford it. They could find odd jobs. They might get an apartment for $40 a month. Because it was there. These buildings were there. There wasn't any other use for them. The landlords came in. It was possible to get by and not be homeless. They tore them all down. What did they replace them with? Well, one of the things here in town they replaced it with was a bodacious water garden. Fort Worth is famous for this water garden that recently killed a whole family of black people because of the poor way that's administered. That put these people in a homeless situation. When this happened, the city said, well, we've got these low-cost dwellings over here on this corner of the downtown area. And they convinced everyone that there was ample housing. No, there wasn't. And today, they've torn that down and put up a quarter of a million dollar townhouses. So you keep creating the situation that leads to making it worse, creating more homeless putting more people out on the streets, not because they're not willing to work or maybe not even because they don't have jobs. They just don't have jobs that pay enough that they can afford a roof over their heads or find one. So what I'm saying is this is designed, this is socially engineered. And right now people have unsecured mortgages. They don't have perfected mortgages. They can be making their house payments on time or whatever and still they foreclosed on. And that's happening. So, (laughs) I mean, it's not a matter anymore of bad luck. It's not a matter of social inequities. It's a matter of design. It is a matter that bankers are able to commit fraud and get people in mortgages that are imperfect and that can be foreclosed on a whim. And this is happening in this country left and right because this country is being looted. Technically, I don't think you've been able to actually own a piece of land in the United States probably since shortly after the Civil War, I think about 1873. Now, there may be a few places in the United States where you can still buy a piece of land and acquire an allodial title to that land, but it's pretty rare that type of property is pretty much not available, certainly not to the common man. I mean, about the best you can do is is own real estate. And if you own real estate, you're a tenant on the land. I mean, you're a serf. I'm a serf myself. I own numerous pieces of real estate, but I do not own any land. My property could be taken from me on a moment's notice because I missed a $120 property tax bill. And there have been cases. There was a case in D.C. where a 72-year-old veteran was thrown out of the home that he paid $9,500 cash for 50 years ago, was tossed out on the street because the guy is not all there, okay, suffering a little bit of Alzheimer's, but he's self-sufficient. He was getting by. He had his little bitty pension. He had his little home that was free and clear and paid for, but he just flat neglected to pay a $130 property tax bill. He's now among the homeless. Now, you know, that is not solving the problem. What I'm looking for is, can we find a solution that would keep a guy like that in his home? He was happy, okay? He lived a simple life. He was not wealthy. He didn't have a Cadillac, didn't have anything fancy, but he was happy. He could have lived out what few years he had left to him. 
and been, you know, no burden on society. People that are fulfilling their obligations to the contract under which they bought their home still being foreclosed on illegally because the law is not enforced equitably. Corporations are able to get away with murder and they do so because they have corrupted the lawmakers themselves and the Supreme Court. You'll get no argument from me on that one. Uh, the government no longer works for the people, hasn't worked for the people for a long time. The only thing different today than it was back when Nixon was running the show is that now they're right in your face with it. They don't care if you know. They don't care. They're right in your face with it. Back when Nixon was president, at least they crept up from behind and hit you in the back of the head with a two-by-four. Nowadays, they walk right up to you. So well, uh, that's the better, only difference I see. People better understand that the signs for martial law and for the beginning of something that is going to create a situation which will end in, in the earth being a place no one will want to live is within a short period of time of happening. And this is no exaggeration. If you will look at the environmental degradation that we are putting up with, it's only going to get worse unless we do something to stop it. But isn't it all because of us greedy people who run around driving SUVs? Isn't that what's causing all the no, problem? Or, or, no. or do you think maybe, you know, Corexit and Fukushima might have a little bit to do with it? Corexit, Fukushima, the reactors that are seaboard, no one but a madman will build a reactor on the seashore. Or no. on a fault line. Yeah, or on the fault right. line, but most of them are. Yep, Let's almost all it. of them. Most of them are built in situations where they're inviting disaster. Well, Fukushima technology. is spouting enough isotopes out right now to shorten the life of everyone on this planet. How long were we told that it wasn't yet a Chernobyl magnitude? That was a lie from the very start. Now it is 5,000 times worse than Chernobyl. 5,000 times. Are you eating sushi out of the Pacific? Anybody that will eat anything <laughs> from Japan is asking for it. And, you know, a colleague of mine did a show here recently on this Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Oh, that that's another trying gem. To, Oh, yeah. Well, that's going to take away our rights to know what we're eating, where it comes uh. from, whether it's GMO or not. You know, corporations will exert complete dominance. National sovereignty will end. We will all be serfs to the 300 biggest corporations on the planet. Well, technically, we're already there. Technically, well, we are it, already it there. it won't last very uh, long because they have this. degraded the planet and they're not going to stop. These are madmen. Well, yeah, of course. If they can... If they can raise the amount of their bottom line by contaminating the Great Barrier Reef, if they can do exactly there, and this is not far blown because all the corrects that BP did not use in the Gulf of Mexico that it had left over is now being stored in Australia right near where the Great Barrier Reef is, and they're starting to use it there. For what? You create a spill, you've got a justification to use it. Now, we're deforesting the Amazon Basin. We're contaminating the Pacific Ocean. We're starting to contaminate where 30% of our oxygen comes from in the Atlantic trough in the Great Barrier Reef. You see what I'm saying? This planet cannot sustain life at this rate, anybody's life. And running away to holes in the ground is not going to help these people survive. They may survive a little longer than the rest of us, but not much. This is the reality of the situation. And you're thinking that the disappearing homeless is just the first wave, that next they'll be coming for the it's old the first people, wave. and then they'll I be coming for the gypsies, and then they'll be coming for the handicapped, and they it's came the for the Jews, mentality. and I said nothing. It's the Third Reich mentality. It's the same mentality. But I think the child trafficking has been largely responsible for this. So we have pedophile networks all over the world. If you don't believe me, read what you can find out on what happened in Belgium, the Belgium X-Files. Go online, see for yourself how these networks, which provide the elite with children for their pedophile tastes, 
this is encouraged. This is the ultimate perversion, the luxury that is afforded people that want to have this kind of uh, indulgence, sick people. But that's the kind of people that are into policy making for the world right now. I mean, there's no secret about it. There was a time when the FBI would come out and just absolutely deny that these things existed. They don't anymore. There was a time when there would be local reports of Satanism, and the FBI would poo-poo that. It would go out, and if there was any evidence, they would hide it. Because they were told, beginning with J. Edgar Hoover, that these things just couldn't happen in America. So if they couldn't happen, they didn't happen, no matter what the evidence to the contrary was. And today we know that this is practiced. There are people that have come out of the Illuminati and talked about how in the Illuminati they worship Lucifer. They have a coming-of-age ceremony in a vault below the Vatican that is monstrous, where they disembowel a four- or five-year-old. These things are online. People can find out for themselves. This one person that came forward from the Illuminati was a programmer, a key programmer in the Illuminati. They program each other. And she goes by the name Sally, and there are videos that you can see. People doubt this. All they have to do is see that video or those videos, and then they will have a leg up, a firm basis to decide for themselves. Until they do, they don't. I think the problem is nobody wants to believe. Of course not. Anybody could be that sick and that twisted. You know. Well, Gary, you know for a fact that there are people who exalt themselves with these indulgences. You just want to believe that the Jeffrey Dahmers of the world and the others of that ilk, you want to believe that this is some weird anomaly that every once in a while pops up for some weird reason. But you don't want to believe that there is an organized group that is actually in control, that actually pulls your strings, who are into that type of twisted behavior. You know, you, you, you no, know, but the, the problem is, I think it's, it's cognitive imbalance. You know, you just can't get your head wrapped around the fact that the people who are in control of the world are that sick. You know they're a little twisted. It seems like power attracts somewhat twisted people. You know, we see it in our politicians. You know, they're, they're, they're a bunch of inbred scum. You remember what they call that ceremony that they practice at Bohemia Grove? Oh, the assassination of care or something. I can't remember. Yes. In other words, the denuding of compassion. But you want to think that's like the secret club handshake or or the Catholics worship idols, according to the Protestants. You want to think it's just a harmless tongue-in-cheek silliness, you know. I've also heard rumors that, uh, you know, guys like Henry Kissinger dance around naked. I don't want to see that. I don't want to know that happens. You know, I don't want You wouldn't pay the dues to see that. No, I do not. I do not want that image in my head. You know, put some clothes on, Henry. Come on. Uh, He's not very attractive with clothes on. No, no. I put a bag over his head for crying out loud. But, you know, I think average Joe out there, you know, they know something's wrong. They sense it. Okay, nobody's stupid. I I get a little annoyed when people refer to my neighbors as sheep and consider them stupid or asleep or whatever. No, no, no. They know something's going on. They don't like it. It smells bad. They know it smells bad. They can't quite put their finger on exactly what it is, but they know something's wrong. The problem is they got kids in college. They got a mortgage to pay. They got a job they're going to every day. Right now, they're hanging on by the skin of their teeth. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to cause any waves. My European friends, I have viewers that watch my alternative energy show from all over the world. And many times I get emails from them saying, when are you guys going to get off your ass? You know, the whole world is looking to the United States. You know, you guys are supposed to be the rabble rouser. You guys are supposed to change things. You know, we're looking to you to be the leaders. And I got to tell them, we're running in quiet desperation here. Average Joe is so overwhelmed with all the assaults that are coming at him from so many different directions, and he's just barely hanging on. There but for the grace of God, go I. I could be that homeless guy on the street. They're just flat afraid 
to rock the boat. Now, the fact is, at this stage in the game, they don't have a whole lot left to lose. Exactly. It's only going to take just a little bit more, just a little bit more. That's when the human animal becomes dangerous, isn't it? You betcha. When you no longer have anything left to lose and you no longer fear your own demise, you become one dangerous SOB. And there's an awful lot of people who are getting very close to that mark at this point. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if this Obamacare doesn't throw a lot of us over that edge. Well, if anybody will stop and read that thing, and of course it's 20 some odd thousand pages, but if they will go through it, do a cursory study of it, it'll raise the hair on the back of the necks. I remember a movie, Soyant Green. Oh yeah. Charlton Weston. Obamacare. And is, Edward G. Robinson. I think yes, that's one yes. of Edward G. Robinson's last I think last it's one of his last. Before he died. Yeah, last movies. And, uh. Great old character uh, actor. Played a hell of a mobster. He did. He did with James Cagney. Yeah. You're about as old as me. (laughs) (laughs) I may have you by a few. (laughs) Well, you sound like you might be about 60. Is that about right? right? Yeah, I'm cruising in towards mid-60s, yeah. Well, I'm your senior, so show some respect. All right. I'll show some respect. (laughs) I'll show some respect. I went in the Navy during the Cuban crisis. And, okay, so, so you, you weren't in the Spanish-American War, but you did No, make... I wasn't in the Spanish uh, I don't think any of those guys are around kicking. If they are, yeah. I'd like to talk. Well, you know, I, I fought the war in Vietnam on the streets of Washington, D.C., trying to drag your ass back home from a war that you never should have been involved in. I respect the fact you performed your duty, but, you know, I was fighting that war getting beat and pepper gassed on the streets of D.C. You know, I went in in 63, and I was out in 65. And I was very active against the war. I was working, uh, doing precinct work and uh, canvassing for the Democrat Party there in Michigan. I was going to Michigan State University. And I came across so many instances of soldiers that were involved in that war, and they were going in for second and third duty. And I talked to them, and I had petitions at the time. And I would come up to the house and start talking to them and they would introduce themselves. You don't want to talk to me. I just got back from Vietnam and I was in two melees in one day. And I said, well, you went in and you killed every man, woman, and child? And they said, yes. And I, we think Callie is getting a bad deal. I'm wrapped. I'd sit down and talk with them. And before I left, they and their mother and father all signed my petitions against the war, against the bombing of Laos and Cambodia. Hands down. And I went to a concert on campus, and everybody that was near my age, I'd go up, are you a vet, are you this, are you that, combat vet. So they'd sign these petitions, and I wasn't a combat vet, so I started Viet Vets Against the War. I turned this over to some people in Detroit, and they went on with my petitions, and it got off the ground. But I had guys that had silver stars. One of them was up for congressional citation, and they would put all their decorations, everything on these petitions, you know, the whole nine yards. I never had one combat vet refuse to sign them. You know, that tells you that if you had any firsthand experience in the war in Vietnam, you knew it was wrong. You knew it was pointless. So you knew that it was there for corporations to make money, nothing else. Dave's telling me we're going to take a break. Is that right, Dave? I would appreciate it. A lot of people would like to make their yellow eyes white. I want to get a fresh cup of coffee. Hey, Amen. Five, five minutes? Just about, because I got one Republic come home queued up. All right, he sounds like a plan. I will refresh my adult beverage and be right back. We'll be right back, right. folks, in about five minutes. Welcome to Wolf Spirit Radio. Well, we're back, and before we were leaving, we were addressing Gary. Gary, do you have some more remarks about the 60s? Where is Gary? Rob, do you remember the 60s? I do. He was refilling his adult drink. Oh, all right. Yeah, I well, you know, so well. I was in you the know, place. yeah, uh, there were several things that were the high points of the 60s. One of them was the Kent State Massacre and what the media made of it, which wasn't truthful, because it was very explosive. 
It was the first time the National Guard had ever gone on a campus in this country with loaded guns. And all the students that were killed were killed at a range of over 200 yards. That's snipering. Yeah, I don't think that you can throw a bag of doo-doo 200 yards. But they told everybody that these students were throwing bags of doo-doo, and that's why they were just defending themselves from bags of doo-doo. Well, I remember those days, and I talked to some of the... uh When I lived in Ohio, I talked to some of the people that were witnesses. And I went up to Silver Lake, which is a little community uh, not far from Akron. And there were two or three people there that had been there when that happened. And they said most of those kids that were killed weren't even participating in any demonstration. I saw that, too, in several articles that uh, you can no longer find. But when I stop and think about my own personal experiences in the service, and I am proud, actually, that I did the service, but I am not happy with what I did while I was in the service. But then again, the people I killed does not rest on my head and my hands. And it took me a long time to understand that. Well, it's a strange thing that happens when people are in combat. There have been uh, some good movies made about this and what happens, but it's a dehumanizing experience for anybody. You don't think that it is. Now, I am told that the first time anybody kills another human being, they have a gut-level reaction. It's traumatic, and they should. You know, that's funny. I was 14 when I killed my first human being, and it didn't bother me because... The godfather handed a shotgun to my father and said, Tom, it's your turn. My dad just looked at him. I took the shotgun, blew the guy's head off. I said, that's how you do it, Dad. And it has never bothered me. Were you uh, prepared for that sort of thing? No, not really. But then again, when you stop and think, I am a Mark Ultra Project Talon graduate. Well, that's what I mean. Yes. I prepared. I was prepared in ways that I still don't understand. Well, you know, I was on a Mind Control L forum, Mind Control L, and I met a lot of the monarchs, the culture of monarchs, that were created as sex slaves, basically. And they all pretty well said the same thing. Most of them were for getting back at what had been done to them and helping other people, other women that had been abused that way. But there were always a few that wanted to learn how to do it to others. I would imagine the same is true of the super soldiers. Except I am doing what I can with Wolf Spirit Radio to uh, make sure that people are aware of what happens with these mind control programs. But for me, it was relatively simple. Once I understood what I had gone through, I became a Mark Alter Project Helen graduate, not a victim. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it's simply this. I made a choice. I made a decision that I was not going to allow it to bother me. But there were so many people involved in me gaining that key to that door down that hallway of memories that had a light on it that was shining brightly for me to be able to step through there and say, Jesus, what have I done? Did you feel like you were a victim too? Not really, because when my son, the youngest son was 12 years old, he and I were fishing in the middle of Lake Strawberry up in Northern California. He looked at me as we were rowing back in because he had a stringer full of fish and I had none, which is not unusual. He's 12 years old, he pops a beer, takes a drink and says, Daddy, what'd you do in Vietnam? What'd you really do? Because man, at times you're really fucked up. That's the night the nightmare started. He has triggered so many things that enabled me to understand what was done to me without my consent that, okay, this is what happened, but it's in the past. I do not allow the past to guide my now and future. And that is something I understand that many people are never going to have that understanding that I have. And with the way the people are waking up around the world, 
And with shows like this, it's going to be heard by hundreds of people eventually. That's what we're here for. We're here to wake you people up to what the hell's going on. We're aware of it. Yes, we are aware of it. We're awake, we're alert, and we are aware, and we're trying to share that with you people. Don't believe us? Do your own research, because every host I have had has come on here, has said that same thing. Don't believe what we have to say. Do your own research. Make your own choice. Amen. That's like, you know, light and dark workers. That's two sides of the same coin. Too much of the alternative media has been influenced to go the other way. And that's a shame. And you see it. They consist of gatekeepers. They consist of the cottage industry. They consist of people that won't discuss things like we're discussing tonight. You won't get, like, for instance, uh, one person, I won't mention any names, but uh, he's very well known, he's very well established, has a whole network. He'll never discuss anything like the disappearing homeless. You know, people are conditioned to accept a biblical admonition about this. You'll always have your poor. Well, you not necessarily. We used to call it opinion forming, and it was okay for the networks to do it. It was the American way. It was never the American way, and today it's just flat mind control. And they have people entrained that no matter what that story is at 5 o'clock or at noon on the major network television, if it's not repeated later on, and they see it on every news program the rest of the day, and then the next day, in many cases, then it's not real. Because they've been ingrained to believe only what is reaffirmed in a repetitive way, is real. It's just sensational or it's conspiracy theory or whatever, or somebody had a bad night out, you know, they're misstating reality. You know, I've seen it over and over again. You sit there and you watch something really sensational come out. There was a story here that both these cases occurred in California, and this was about 12, 13 years ago. A lady came into an emergency room. Her vital signs were off the chart. They started to administer an IV, probably Ringer's solution or maybe glucose. The minute that they stuck this into her vein, this green gas gave off and killed everybody in the OR. Everybody. This was on the news. This was on the national news. But it wasn't repeated later. And then a couple of weeks later, they had the same thing happen in another town further south in California. It's the same thing. Let's take something very important to what's going on right now. I, that's a sarin gas that was supposedly used in Syria by the Syrian government. It wasn't. I know that, that you gentlemen know about the signature that's in gunpowder, that no matter who makes gunpowder today, every different manufacturer, by the way they put that gunpowder together, has a signature so that you can track who made that gunpowder. If it's in any kind of explosive... That way they can track how it came historically to be in the hands of whoever the perpetrator might be. Well, sarin gas has a chemical signature, and they have tracked that to an American corporation in Georgia, the former Republic of the Soviet Union. You're not hearing about that anywhere in the world. I came across it briefly. But nobody will pick the story up because there's too much pressure for them to have this war, for them to throw out Assad. And another thing that's not discussed, in all of the arguments and the debates and the Congress people that are speaking out and running kind of a consensus from the constituents and so forth, and I was on one last night with Kay Granger. I was called up and asked to participate on the phone town hall meeting. We were discussing Syria and and did you have any questions or do you have something to say? Well, I didn't get to participate, but I listened to everybody else did. Do you think they ever mentioned the petrodollar? No, never mentioned the petrodollar. They never mentioned the absurdity of bombing cities out of a concern for children's lives. The guys who are in Afghanistan and Iraq at this point are mostly private mercenaries. They're contractors. They're paid very, very well to paint a target on their back. But when they turn up dead, they're not counted as military casualties. That's, right. That's how they're mousing the numbers. Now, I happen to know a few people who do that type of work. 
They're not particularly proud of it, but it's what they do. And a lot of those boys are coming back in bags with no flag draped over them, and it's not discussed. It's not discussed. John Steinbeck wrote two great books. The last great book, people are not talking about. They don't seem to have read it. It wasn't promoted very much. It was called In Dubious Battle. And it is a very good rendering of the reality behind occupying a hostile nation. The occupation in many ways, is worse than the war. And this is the condition that you have in Afghanistan and Iraq right now. We are paying to occupy these countries as a hostile. We are a hostile. We are paying a price that is equivalent to the war itself, in life, in human life, and in monetary cost. They play this down because they want you to think, we came in, we conquered, now everything's settled. Well, we know that's not true. I mean, every American should know that's not true. But they don't have the slightest idea how great the cost really is. Just like you were uh, talking but about, the, Gary. The, the, the spice from Afghanistan flows, so, you know, that's all that's important. Yeah, during those Talibanis, you know, they weren't making sure that the Queen of England got her vig off the opium trade, but that's now back in full force. I understand that, you know, heroin on the street is... Cheap enough, anybody can afford it nowadays. So, you know, that's progress. That is the American way. American people are not giving good history lessons anywhere, not even in college. I mean, how many people do you know that know anything about the opium wars? You know, know anything <laughs> about the indemnity uh, no, treaties was, that came out of them? It wasn't called the opium wars. That was something else. You know, they didn't call it. No, it wasn't, had nothing to do with opium. Those scurious uh, Chinese were messing with the Brits' free trade. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, that's the way it's taught. You know, the English had nothing the Chinese wanted. But the English wanted their silk. They wanted their spices. They wanted a number of things the Chinese had. So they created a market. They flooded China with opium that they brought into China from India. And after about 10 years, it was so prevalent, smoking opium in the opium dens in China was so prevalent that the emperor couldn't find able-bodied men to dig a canal he wanted to dig. So he outlawed opium. And then the English declared they used an incident. It's called the incident. And the war that ensued was called the War of Jenkins Ear. And uh, they sailed a gunship up Yangtze River and fired on the emperor's palace. And, of course, he didn't want to fight a war. So he said, let's end this. Oh, well, you've got to buy so many tons of opium this next year at so many towels. It's Chinese dollars. And so it got so bad. And, of course, the French are looking over there. They want their share. So they do the same thing. They create a war. And then they exact an indemnity treaty with China. And so Russia looks over and they say, well, you can't get away with just France and England. So they do it. And then America does it. So you got four nations right now that have indemnity treaties with China. It was so bad that the dowager empress would just turn the treasury over to these monsters and they would exact everything that was there plus a deficit that they would impose in addition the next year. They wanted to charge interest on it, too, because, you know, compound interest rules the world. I look at the cheap crap that the Chinese send over here, their favored trading nation clause that the Clintons were bribed to give them. I look at that with mixed feelings because they're getting even with us, you know, and that's in their mind. They don't forget a thing. They're small people, but they have an elephant's memory. By the same token, you and I are old enough to remember when all that cheap crap came from Japan. Don't you remember everything that came in a box of Cracker Jacks was made in Japan? It was a little bit better than the Chinese. At least they weren't selling us. Well, they weren't selling us poisoned air wigs. Well, yeah. They weren't selling us poisoned dog food and cat food. Melamine and the baby food and, you know. Yeah. Yeah, well, okay. uh, Oh, yeah, I'll give them that. But I like the Chinese. I mean, I think they're the oldest civilization on Earth. My God, they have had an interesting civilization that has been steady for 7,500 years. And there's a lot of color to it. And everyone that thinks that Genghis Khan was a monster ought to study him. Today, he is one emperor that they revere. And nobody's ever found his tomb or probably ever will because where it might be, they won't let anybody in there. You know, uh-huh. the largest pyramids in the world. And they think his tomb is in one of them. There are actually 
pyramids all over the world, but the ones in China are some of the most intriguing because, as far as I can tell, only a handful of them have ever been excavated. Most of them have been touched. It's said that only about 20% of what's in Egypt has actually been excavated, that there are cities under the sand that are waiting for the next couple generations to take a look at. So, you know, we kind of think, you know, oh, you know, Egypt's passe. We've seen everything there that could be seen. No, some of the satellite imagery from Egypt would have you believe that uh, what's now the desert was once an urban center. Do you know know what the Sahara Desert was called at the time of Alexander the Great? No, don't know. The Fertile Crescent. Wait a minute. I thought that was over on the other side. No. The Sahara Uh, Desert. Wasn't that the Tigris and Euphrates? I thought that was the Fertile Crescent. It is now. But I'll tell you, we have gotten off topic, and this happens to me all the time. You get me talking, and there's just so many interesting things going on out there. But, you know, I would still like to see if this small group might have some suggestion on this homeless issue. I mean, if you were king of the United States, if you were king of the United States, how would you solve the problem of the homeless? It is a problem. And keep in mind, you've got a number of constituencies that are, that are stakeholders. You know, I wouldn't want to be the guy with the chicken stand who's got homeless people hanging out in front of his chicken stand, panhandling, scaring away his business. I mean, put yourself in that guy's position, okay? So he's going to go to the city commissioners, and he's going to say, damn it, I want those homeless people removed from in front of my chicken joint. Well, you know, this guy's a stakeholder in the city. He's a, he's a member of the small business community. The city fathers owe him a listen. They've got to consider him constituency. Now, obviously, you don't want to tread on the rights of the homeless person. I mean, that person technically is not doing anything illegal. So, you know, how do you solve the problem so that the constituencies who are stakeholders feel like, you know, nobody has gotten everything they wanted, but nobody has gotten totally trumped on. How do you make everybody reasonably satisfied with an accommodation? I can tell you that grabbing them all up and putting them in a FEMA camp, that don't fly with me. And if I find out that's really going on, I'm not only going to be pissed, but I may actually pay a visit to the nearest FEMA camp and set up a sign and just wait for them to try and do something to me. I've been known to do things like that. Well, Gary, there are answers. You just have to have people that are sincere to look for them. And, of course, no one solution is going to work every place. You have to understand that the economy, that particular place, the kind of production that's going on, first of all, I would stop depending on other nations for our cotton. What amazes me is that no one ever talks about one of the biggest mistakes that is made in this nation. We are the warmongers of the world right now, and yet we don't have a steel industry. Don't you find that to be a, a huge concern? And all of our electronics for our weaponry come from China, a potential adversary. Yeah, believe me, it it does sometimes make my head spin. We are so ill-prepared to fight a war, as poorly prepared as we were for World War II. We're, We're counting on our potential enemies for our war materials going into World War III. Okay, look, I'm no brain trust. I'm no rocket scientist, and I can do sarin, and I can do rice in my kitchen. Okay, that's how easy those compounds yeah. are to produce. And napalm, oh, come on. You gasoline, okay. just take gasoline and put soap in it. Well, actually, styrofoam works really good. The fact of the matter is, many of these materials that we're hyperventilating over, let's put it this way, the World War I class of chemical weapons are so easy that anybody who understands basic chemistry can do it. Now, tell me that a dedicated jihadist couldn't put that stuff together. Come on, give me a well, break. The, the uh, industry the is about big core corporations making big bucks because there is no other industry other than the munitions industry, the war machine industry, that can make more money per capita for each worker than the defense industry. The only thing the United States makes, the only thing we export all around the world is trouble. It's been that way for about the last 25, 30 years. I don't like it. It embarrasses me, but I don't know what I can do to change it. You know, it's like I say, I've been involved in this battle for an awful long time, and I'll probably be involved in it until the day I don't wake up in the morning. But I just don't have 
an easy oh, solution. <laughs> Unless everybody decided to maybe elect me king. You know, let me well, let me be king intended. for the last ten years of my life and I'll fix it. <laughs> this is no accident. This is a social engineering that is described and laid out in report from Iron Mountain. The industrialization of the industrial nations. That even went into global warming. It called it in that day and time the greenhouse effect. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. For a while there, we were headed into an ice age, and all of a sudden, we were going to cook. I don't know what the heck happened. Most geophysicists and geologists today will tell you we're on the verge of an ice age. They will tell you that. They will tell you openly that global warming is a myth. It's a lie. Well, all the economists for all the think tanks were led down the primrose path when they were told... Well, all of this doesn't matter because we can prop up the American dollar through OMEC with the petrodollar by forcing all these countries in the Middle East to be paid for their oil with the American dollar. Well, that's why we're at war with Syria right now. That's why that's going on there, because Assad has declined to accept those conditions. So as there, was a, there was a pipeline that was going to deliver Iran. From Qatar. Yeah, yeah from Qatar. Yeah, that was a no-no. That would have competed with our friends in Israel. Let me tell you something about what happened to Japan. You know that Saddam Hussein was set up to invade Kuwait in order to try and get a port on the Gulf. Iraq did not have a port on the Persian Gulf. Once Kuwait had been part of Iraq, and they wanted at least to work out some kind of arrangement where Iraq could have a port. He was arguing with our ambassador at the time, Ambassador Gillespie, a lady. And she assured him that, well, maybe if you can settle this issue with Kuwait by whatever means, that would bring peace to the Middle East. So that's when he started amassing this military might on their barter with Kuwait. He was encouraged by her, and there's a transcript of that conversation. So he goes in. Okay, now what could be the motive for trying to get Kuwait invaded by Saddam Hussein? What could be the motive? Well, a number of years before, Japan had contracted all of Kuwait's oil and was going to build refineries in Japan and refine oil for export. That's the biggest no-no in the world. Seven Sisters went ballistic because Standard Oil is supposed to control the refining of oil, oil, period. So when Japan went to find tankers, they couldn't find anyone that leased some tankers. They don't have shipyards. They went to Ireland. They couldn't find anyone that would build them tankers. Suddenly, the Japanese yen fell from about, I think it was 125 to the dollar to like 225 to the dollar, and they had a banking collapse. You could probably remember it. Well, they waited 12 years. And got even with Kuwait. And they set Saddam Hussein up for when they could engineer a war with Iraq, didn't they? It was all in their planning stage. This was designed much earlier than that. Well, I was reading in the Arab News about six months before Fukushima went that Japan again had contracted all of Kuwait's oil and was building the refineries in Vietnam. And I said to myself, Aha. I wonder what they're going to do to Japan. Well, I'm still not convinced that that earthquake and tsunami were engineered. But, yeah. Well, the stick next virus, it was in the computer system that was running that reactor. They did use the right type of control systems that Stuxnet could have been a problem. The design of the reactor was seriously flawed. Of course, we've got 27 that are of exactly the same design. Yeah, you know who built those reactors. That's our friends at General Electric. Westinghouse. I thought that was the GE design. Westinghouse put the spent fuel tank in a separate room where GE put it four stories up right above the reactor. And and frankly, it's those spent fuel pools that are the biggest challenge right now. Well, they're the Uh, biggest problem because those spent fuel rods are burning. Yep, that and the fact that, of course, we got corium. Thousands (laughs) and tons of them. Back in the day, we were concerned about the China syndrome. I wonder where the uh, corium will come out from Japan. What do you think, somewhere around Tuscaloosa? They have all gone down. All four reactor cores have gone down. And nobody's got a plan. And there is no plan. There is nothing they can do. There is a plan. They can contain it. 
they could have contained it earlier. Now it would take an army. But at Chernobyl, I think they used thousands of military. But they were able to encompass that reactor core in graphite. It was a different type. Well, actually, it was a graphite reactor. Theirs was not the light water reactor type that the Japanese had. So they had that advantage. And it was also built on a bed of boron. So as primitive a reactor as that Chernobyl thing was, and it was a doggy reactor. You know, there was another reactor at the other end of the building. They continued to run it for another 12 years. Sure. We had three miles back in the seventies. And when they shut the reactor number two down, they found the reactor core of that first reactor on top of the cooling tower of the second one. So oh you my. can imagine what those workers are being exposed to, but they were taking potassium iodide. So they survived. The Soviets had the second leading nuclear industry in the world, and they didn't have potassium iodide. The United States shipped it to them. But then again, when Fukushima went, all the pharmacies in the United States were told to take their potassium iodide off the shelves. I know I had trouble getting it for a little while. Well, about the only way you can get it is in legal solution, and I recommend everyone in the world to start taking potassium iodide Legal Solution will have two percentages. They'll have the free iodine percentage, and they will have the potassium iodide. You want the 4%, take the 4% potassium iodide, two drops of it every day in a glass of milk or in fruit juice, but take it every day. Every day, that'll saturate your thyroid so that the iodine-131 won't go in and kill it. And do this for your children. Your children are far more sensitive to it than you are. Do it. It is an act of survival and an act of love. The folks on the West Coast of the United States are going to be really smacked pretty hard. and probably They the already next, are. The well, incidents of thyroid. They're already getting it. They're, they're already getting children it. Children is the, suffering. The, the big plume is still coming. You know, we're, we're still, you know, I think yeah. six months from the major plume. And nobody's talking about it. Nobody's talking about it. And our friends in Europe, they think it's so far away for them. They're absolutely immune. Well, guess what? Radioactivity from Fukushima is already showing up in New Zealand. Do you know that the deadliest byproduct from fission is tritium? And just about five or six months ago, they discovered that the reactors at Fukushima were producing tritium. And it's going to the Pacific Ocean, of course. Tritium's got a fairly short half-life, though. I mean, we're only talking a 12-year half-life for tritium. You know, some well, of the stuff that's coming out of there, it'll still be glowing in the dark four, five, six generations from now. Well, it takes a smaller amount of tritium to kill you than any other isotope. So 12 years is an awful long time. And remember, that's half-life. This will contaminate a lake three parts per million. I'm not seeing anything about Fukushima coming out of mainstream news here. At least they're not comparing it with Chernobyl anymore, and they're not telling us it's all right. Before Dave blows us out of here, I do want to get something out there, you know. For those who think that the American spirit is dead, please guess again on the 11th, 12th, and 13th of October. We're going to have a very active group of truck drivers, the independent truck drivers in the United States that are forming a protest. They're doing a drive on D.C. The intent is to shut Washington down for three days. We've just recently had... You know, they said it was going to be two million. It turned out it was only eight hundred thousand, but still eight hundred thousand long haired crazies on motorcycles drive through DC recently. I was part of a protest not too long ago in DC that was protesting against Obamacare. You know, our numbers in that protest were two million and I never saw anything on mainstream news never. about it. But there yeah. were two million people marching on DC with not just no, but hell no, Obamacare. So, you know, don't think that the American spirit is dead. It's not. We're out there. We're out there yelling and screaming. The fact of the matter is we're being ignored. And we're I tell being you, ignored. I tell That's you, okay. it's starting to make me and a lot of other people downright angry. You know, we're supposed to have the right for redress of our government, it's supposed to be built into the Constitution. This is our right. The government is supposed to serve us. And if enough of us get together and let yell and scream, the government's supposed to take action. Well, their only action has been to ignore us. 
according to some spurious executive order that is secret or whatever, I'm sure. Now, I don't know for certain, but it'd be a good guess that we are committing terrorism right now. I have no doubt. You know what? Every time I get a chance, I like to acknowledge the NSA by telling them what to do with themselves. I'm sure my handler over at the CIA really appreciated that because, you know, he wanted you to plug his three-letter boys. And the guys in a black suburban who park every night outside the front of my house that I take the donuts with the pink sprinkles and the coffee I, tea. I, well, I pity the people in Australia who bought them because that's their main installation there. I pity them because they were sold a bill of goods by their corrupt government to let those people install their big ear. And now they've got this thing in Utah, which they call Mr. Computer, and it's up and running. And it's supposed to be dosed with artificial intelligence, and it's going to be the super collector and coordinator and refiner and everything else, of all this data that's coming in from everywhere else. And I remember a, a movie, The Forbin Project, and later they kind of redid it. I think they called it War Games with a young Matthew Broderick. But yeah, when the computers become too smart for their own britches, it's time to pull the plug. They have asked applications of computer technology that you won't hear about for another couple of years if you do then. But they can interface a computer with the human mind. Um, yes, there's some experiments are going on in that area, but it's no, not. They have it now, and it's easier Sonic than you think. It is a very active program to use such an interface to give people who've lost their arms and legs, uh, robotic arms and legs. Now, if a technology was produced to do that, a lot of us would be standing up and cheering. We would say, oh, what a marvel of technology. The problem is the Terminator robot is not very far behind. The two technologies are joined at the hip. You know, we may indeed, very soon, within our lifetimes, be able to give people back their arms and their legs with using robotic technology with this mind-computer link that's being discussed. That's very real. It's not science fiction. It's very real. It's still in its infancy. They still got a ways to go as far as I know. They may have perfected it. I'm, I don't claim to be on the inside, know all the ins and outs, but that is the pitch that they're giving the people about where they're going with this technology. They're not telling you that co-development with DARPA is getting them their robotic drones and their Terminator robots that may indeed be fielded side by side with this new technology being released to, to help paraplegics. If you have enough money, you can have your body sculpted. They have that technology. You can have your physique totally changed, and that's what happened to Lady Gaga. They spent millions of dollars on her, and she has a different physique. If you will look at her first uh, musical video that she made that made her more or less poker face, and then you compare all those subsequent, it's not the same physique. She's been body sculpted. I don't know. This one's wearing out. Can I just trade it in on a new one? <laughs> if you got $4 or $5 million, yes. Uh -huh. $4 or $5 million, that's just not that much. Not in these days. No. <laughs> not, not, if, not you're home, I... if you're homeless, it is. Or if you have a mortgage that isn't perfected and they're trying to steal your home from you. You know, I wonder, James, are, are you personally afraid of homelessness? Would you find that to be a catastrophic event? I don't count. That's not a question that pertains to me. Yeah, I, I think about it. And if I lost everything I have, you know what? I'd still survive. I keep on plugging. You believe in the immortality of the human soul? Uh, do I believe in the immortality of the human soul? Uh, that's a tough one. Probably yeah. not in the manner that most would think. I think you get recycled. I don't think that you maintain your. No, I'm not talking about the body. I'm talking about the soul. The personality that is this soul is a function of this particular lifetime. Frankly, I have a more Eastern philosophy. I believe in the idea of reincarnation, and I suspect that, yeah, you know, I didn't get it right this time, so I'll have to come back again. And I don't want to be burdened with all my memories of this lifetime, so I will start fresh next time out. The immortality of the soul, yeah, but probably not in the way you would think. Well, if you think that this is all you have, then you're living hell on earth when you're threatened with having it taken away. 
aren't you? Well, see, the, the fact is, I recognize the fact that everything I have is an illusion. I recognize that, you know, right now I'm sitting in a very comfortable leather office chair. I have an array of, you know, six computer monitors in front of me. I've got four computers under the desk. I'm probably consuming more power during this two-hour conversation than the average person living in Africa would consume in three lifetimes. So, you know, I'm thinking about this. I'm looking around, and, you know, all this stuff is transitory. It makes my life a little bit more comfortable today. But if I didn't have it tomorrow, I'd still be me. And you know what? I would persevere. Well, that's not a matter of looking at an illusion. That's a matter of value. You profess a non-materialist value, and that's but I love my no material comforts. <laughs> I love my material comforts. <laughs> we need an information central to take in calls from people around the country that know of instances that can be verified where they're seeing these people incarcerated, where they're seeing them guarded and kept from the whistleblowers. Well, just observant people. Whistleblower has the enigma of betraying a trust of some kind. You know, I don't look at it that way, but some people do. And these people are just asked to be observant and do what they can legally to check this out and come up with as much of a validation for what they're seeing and how it plays into what we're talking about. Take Obama's peace prize from him and give it to that guy Snowden. I'm glad you said that. They're trying to discredit him because they don't appreciate the fact that when he came out, he grabbed everything, all the files, everything that he could. He also grabbed this information that they use on their own people. They tell their own people a pack of lies to maintain their loyalty and make them feel good about the horrible things that they're doing. Oh, well, you have to do this because, you know, if we don't do this, somebody else is going to do it first. Then we'd be in trouble and all this The lies that they tell their own people. The CIA was told, for instance, that JFK had to be killed. He was going to start World War III, and just the opposite was true. The president of Russia, or I guess former dictator, whatever you wish to call him, President Putin over here, told Europe the only thing that's kept this guy alive so far is the fact that he has left with a file called Roswell. And they're not so in a hurry to to upset this guy too much more. Because he has this file, which he hasn't released to the public yet. So. He has something that's being held by one of his associates. It is his health card. I don't think that it is the Roswell file that we're talking about. I think it's a great deal more sensitive. There is an aspect to this homeless issue that we haven't discussed, and that's the return to what was once referred to as multi-generational households. There are an awful lot of 20-somethings that's, that's and 30 That's the best suggestion we have made all night. There are an awful lot of grandmas and grandpas who can no longer afford to make it on their little meager Social Security checks. And then you've got this sandwich generation in their 40s through 60s that are taking care of both ends of the spectrum. They're taking care of their old people, and they're also supporting their young. It is a significant problem. Not only do these people fall between the cracks, but there are no programs for them. They don't show up in the numbers. When you look at these numbers about the three-quarters of a million homeless out there, that don't count all the grandmas and grandpas that have had to move back in with their kids. That don't count the kids who now have college degrees. They're spit shine and polished. They're ready to enter the workforce and, and get a piece of the American dream, and there ain't no work for them. And they can't pay their student loans off. The nuclear family is the antithesis to what should be going on. We've got people that have relatives that are homeless that they could take in. We've got people that have a five- or six-bedroom home, and there are people out on the street that have nothing. What's wrong with this picture? We need to really change a number of things about ourselves. Our values are deplorable. The materialism has gone full circle, and it has robbed us of our basic humanity. Now we're paying the price for the status-seeking, for all the things that we've wasted money and gone in debt to have, which mean nothing, which mean absolutely nothing. And how are we going to feel when we do learn 
that these people are being put in the ground. When we could have done something to stop it, we could have done something to help them. We could have found out the truth and told others and got a movement going ourselves like these truckers. That's the answer. Well, maybe we ought to get behind the truckers. They're well organized. They're angry. And And, you know what? Most of all, they're needed. Those truckers are needed. That's right. It's like everything else. You know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my ally. And yes, I will be out there supporting those truckers because you bet. it's a or noble biker, effort. That might be gang members or whatever, but their heart's in the right place. They're Americans and they're pissed. That makes them my ally. We have run past midnight. I'm kind of surprised Dave hasn't already kicked us off the air. Why would I kick off guys that are creating the most incredible show we have ever had on Wolf Spirit Radio? Well, I'll tell you, we've sure covered a lot of ground. Now, what I want to know is, have we saved any whales and fed any hungry? <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope we've made people more concerned about helping the homeless. I really do, and I hope that we have made a start to create a network for information coming through about what's going on. I have very humble expectations. I hope we got one couch potato off the couch and out there angry supporting the truckers or the bikers or whichever issue they want to take ownership of, pick an issue. There's plenty of them out there, and no one person can handle them all. No. I think that really this is a line we should draw in the sand, too, kind of like China and Russia have drawn a line in the sand over Syria. If they are to keep a presence in the Middle East that they have a right to, they have to draw a line in the sand somewhere, don't they? Well, we need to draw a line in the sand here. This must not go forward. This disenfranchising, so completely disenfranchising a segment of the American public, this must not go forward, must not be allowed. Because if we don't draw a line in the sand somewhere, we're going to be there too. What do they call us? Unless you're in a very, very small minority of people, the elite call us, and I'm proud to be one, a useless eater. I more or less resemble that remark. (laughs) Me too. Me too. There are a lot of people that don't think that they're in that category, but they are. There are millionaires that don't think they're in that category, but they are. The ones I just kind of shake my head at are the youngsters I know who've basically gone to work for the Department of Homeland Security. Because those are about the only jobs you can get nowadays. You know, I do live right outside of Washington, D.C. Unless you're a crazy cowboy like me who does the rodeo circuit, your only real choice, and I'm kidding, I'm not a rodeo clown, but I do have an Obama mask. But, <laughs> you know, uh, but about the only work around here is either working for a government contractor or going to work for the government, and basically you're part of the machine. And they honestly think that they're part of the in crowd and that they're not going to be tossed away. The interesting thing is they know it's coming down. They're not stupid. These young kids are not stupid. They're not sheep. They're not asleep. They know what's going on. If they had their way, after it was all said and done, and they depopulated the earth of the 95% of us that they intend, and they've stated this over and over again, it's been kicked around in their periodicals of CFR and the Trilateral Commission now for 40 years that I know about. Oh, yeah, but when they're talking about that, they're just talking about all them black people over in Africa and all them brown people over there. You know, They never actually came right out and said, Hey, Whitey, (laughs) guess what? Well, you know, one of the things that you find in the mass media every once in a while, you'll find some truth. And there was a documentary that I watched about these pharmaceuticals that were being shipped to Africa and ending up on the black market. Even Doctors Without Barters, which is a very fine organization, couldn't get the antibiotics that they needed or the thalamic solution that they can cure an eye disease that will lead to blindness if it isn't treated. They couldn't even get these drugs over in Africa, and they had to resort to the black market. Well, they were finding out that these drugs that were turning up on the black market had the lot numbers. They were packaged by the pharmaceutical companies and sent to Africa, and they were different. They had just enough of the active ingredient to ensure that whatever biological germ or whatever the problem organism was that was causing the disease or the infection or whatever 
or would get just enough to build an immunity. So it was a death sentence to use it. And, of course, the drug companies would say, well, that's pirated drugs. No, it wasn't pirated drugs. They showed on this special that I saw this documentary on. It was either the History Channel or it was the Discovery Channel 1. But they showed how these were packaged, and you could pirate the pill or the serum or whatever they were using. You could do that, but you couldn't pirate the packaging. So (laughs) the pharmaceutical companies were involved in this scheme of genocide because Africa is rich in natural resources that the defense industry and that big corporations need and can't find in the same abundance anywhere else. Like, for instance, cobalt's very important. Also, uh, bismuth, molybdenum, molybdenum. Mm-hmm. The mine that we have in this country that produces most of ours is slowly being depleted, and that's Climax Mines. I think we're still buying tungsten from Russia, aren't we? Tungsten's coming from two different continents, several different countries, but it is expensive. It's far more expensive than it used to be. Because they're using it in all the gold bars, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) At least the ones that are in Fort Knox. And the ones that, you know, the Germans got to have. I pity the Germans. The Germans will never get their gold. Never. They will never get their gold. You know, and that is the most audacious thing about the IMF there is is that the IMF has hoarded this. If you really wanted to know where most of the world's gold is, it's in Israel. You know that gold that came out of the Building 7, underneath the Building 7? That was enough gold probably to refurnish the Treasury of the United States of America. Where did it go? You know? (laughs) What are they going to do with it after they're dead? Because they can't take it with them. Oh, they've got these tales. I mean, there are people that should be smarter than that are telling us that this is what they're going to use to satisfy the Anunnaki's desire for gold because it does something for their atmosphere on their planet. Now, the Anunnaki is supposed to be so superior to us and everything, and in 3,500 years they haven't figured out a better way for climate control on their planet. (laughs) Such a bunch of, oh, man. It makes you wonder, you know, I think that Sitchin did one of the greatest disservices to mankind by feeding us another doomsday device. Of course, I'm going to anger a lot of people by saying that. And I know one of the leading proponents for this, and he's a nice guy. He's sharp, very likable, but, you know, he's sold on this. And, of course, I tell him, I said, you're serving the New World Order with that mush. You know, as creation myths go, it's a nice story. You know, I mean, well, well, you make a Hollywood movie out of it and then go on to something else. Right? Exactly. You know, I mean, yeah. You know, it, it, let's put it this way: it's 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 not so far out that it would surprise me if it was indeed the truth. But most of the creation myths are just that they're creation myths. The people were trying to explain something that was unexplainable and they did the best they could. And this was the tale that the uh, Sumerians came up with. And I'm not even sure that the Sumerians came no, up with it. No, no. Chances didn't. are they inherited it from a previous civilization. No, I don't that. think the Sumerians believed any such thing. I think that Sitchin claimed that he had found tablets he never found. He had no ability with ancient languages that he ever showed, demonstrated. Well, so you think the whole thing's a hoax? The whole thing was a hoax, yeah. Yeah. I've seen two different translations of those, and, and there is a translation out there. It's very similar to Sitchin's translation, but it doesn't weigh so heavily on the space alien interact. These were actually a precursor of mankind type thing. You know, they were the giants, shall we say. I assumed that these tablets did indeed exist and that Sitchin's translation was one of a couple of different interpretations. But you're saying that the tablets themselves were a hoax. The translation of the tablets was a hoax, yeah. Because Sitchin could never point to the tablets. If you ask him, he'd say, oh, they're in a certain museum. Well, when you do any kind of peer review, you're supposed to be able to produce a catalog number for any material that you're using that's found anywhere. And every exhibit in every museum has a catalog number. So all he had to do was give the catalog number of that exhibit that he had supposedly translated, right? Never could. Never produced anything at all. Just said, oh, they're somewhere in a museum or something like that. 
The only reason he was ever promoted is because this fell in line with creating a new doomsday deal. And, you know, if you think that the world is going to come to an end or we're going to be revisited by the Anunnaki, you're going to enslave us and all this other crap. If you fall for that, then are you going to be interested in doing anything about the evils in the world that you might be able to do something about? No. You're going to say, well, we're going to have the end times. We're going to have the world coming to an end. You know, you give up. And that's exactly what has been played by these people that serve this kind of a scenario. A doomsday scenario is very, very welcome to the New World Order because it makes people give up, resign to whatever's coming, instead of looking at what they can do something about. Well, you know, most every major religion, I mean, you look at the Bhagavad Gita, the Kali Yugas, I mean, we're we're supposed to be right on the cusp of a new age, which generally means destruction and rebirth. You look at Christian theology, Christian theology has very, very similar tenets where I understand that a lot of the people who are running our military right now in the Christian theology and believe that they're bringing about the second coming by starting Armageddon. They really believe this. The hand of social engineering began way back there in this lineage, way before recorded history. And there's so many secrets of civilizations that existed that were erudite, that had marvelous histories, and their works are suppressed because they're not in line with the interpretation that these social engineers want to put on the past. That's why every time that they find anything like this recent find in Romania in the Busegi Mountains, they've got to find over there that's being kept under wraps because it has something very similar to what you were told was under the foot of the Sphinx, and that is a Hall of Records. And this Hall of Records would change the way we look at everything from the past. It would show you, for instance, that there were civilizations, maybe even more advanced than ours, a hundred thousand years ago. That Two and a half there million is, years ago. Yeah, well, if you get into the anomalies in archaeology, you find some of the weirdest things imaginable. You find things that are not in accordance with a linear causality. And as you get into this and you start seeking for answers, you find out that we need a different model, even for timekeeping, in order to really reflect what's going on. Because our minds remake what we see to conform to our expectation. That's why if you go into court of law, a lawyer will sit there and he'll have five witnesses to the same event. And all of them had, let's say, all five of them had pretty well the same vantage point of observation, and yet their accounts will be different. They'll differ because they put things in order according to what they expected. There is such a thing as power of expectation, which is good, and a power of expectation, which is bad. When we conform to our expectation and try to make other things that we're seeing conform to it, in that recreation, we actually rewrite history, and we do it unconsciously. But if you have the discipline to be very alert and very penetrating observer, you can get over that and you can actually see what's in front of you for what it is and report it in a way that reflects the truth. But so many people can't do that. So many people have psychic blocks to what's going on in front of them if they don't have an expectation that it can exist. I have a phenomenon that occurs near where I live, and when Kevin Smith spent some time with me, he saw it too and talked about it on his show. And this is of planes coming overhead and then descending to going down and freezing in the sky, going straight down. To see something like that, and I have some time-lapse exposures that I took of several of these, which I've shared online, but people can't believe it. They can't even believe it when I show them. But now, if they're here when this happens, in most cases, I have to describe it for them first before they can see through their own psychic block because they're not prepared to see something like that for what it is. And that speaks a lot to the condition of people on this planet. The mind fills in what the eye thinks it's supposed exactly. to Exactly. That was there, a very helpful characteristic when, you know, we climbed down out of the trees and started wandering around the grasslands. Well, just it helped us spot it, threats. It's a factor of the split consciousness. Because we have a split consciousness, we can be hypnotized, can't we? Now, being able to be hypnotized is not a good thing. No matter what people tell you that exploit it, it's not a good thing. Because 
they'll tell you that you won't do anything under hypnosis that you wouldn't do normally. You wouldn't do anything out of character. Well, what they can do is they can create a situation where you think you're defending your life or the life of a loved one, and you kill somebody under that illusion that has been created by the hypnotist. So, no, you will do things thinking you're doing the right thing that don't seem out of character at all for you at the time, but are the act is. When you get into this closely and you see how this is used in subliminal imprinting in all sorts of ways, you understand that this contributes to the way in which they use mind control on people, even in television presentations, even in lectures. Well, the television's full of it. I won't even yeah. watch television anymore. I haven't watched television in 20 years. There's a person that's in the so-called alternative media that uses NLP when he's talking uh, as a guest on shows. He's using NLP. And he makes no sense with anything he says. But people come away and they think they have been rewarded with some understanding. And if you question them, they've been rewarded with nothing. They are worse off in their capacity to grasp what they heard then before he was talking. And he admits that he was under mind control and had been and that he had had this kind of thing used on him, but he's using it on people too. If I refer to him, you'd recognize the name. A lot of people use it without even... Well, there are people out there who do have it as an innate capability. And uh, Again, I'm I'm a science fiction fan, so I liken it to the Bene Gesserit voice there are people out there who understand at an intuitive level neuro linguistic programming. And this is a term that, that's been put on it. But this this is not a new phenomenon either. This has been around no, no. ever since there's been human beings. The most the famous example uh, is the Bible thumping preacher. That Bible yeah. thumping preacher knows exactly how to package that message so it gets through all your blocks. There have been people that actually could assert their will on others. There was one at the time of Madame Blavatsky that was very famous. You'd never hear this individual mentioned today, but his name was Brother Jonah. You've heard of the Russian Mad Monk. Yeah. He had the ability to do this, and and he had the Rachmaninoff family under his thumb because he could keep the prince. The young prince was still a child, and he had hemophilia. And every time he'd start bleeding, this guy could stop the bleeding. So the Tsarina was totally under his control, and the court eventually killed him. Took him a few tries, too, if I remember correctly. Well, they fed him a cake full of arsenic, uh, and he thrived on it. He loved it. <laughs> well, that's, that's the thing. Arsenic doesn't affect everybody the same way. It doesn't affect every species the same way. He was extraordinary, but Brother Jonathan was something else, as much as Rasputin. 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 That's, yeah, that's, that's a good uh, Rasputin was something else, but Brother Jonathan was even more extraordinary. You know that the guy that started JPL was into sexual psychic magic. He was one of Crowley's followers, wasn't he? Well, uh, no, but Crowley wanted to make him his heir to the Golden Dawn, Parsons. Parsons, yeah. That's and uh, Parsons had a buddy that had this ability. And this, I mean, the only way you could uh, describe these people is that they're ungodly. But they were doing things with sexual psychic magic that Crowley never dreamed of. And, of course, Crowley was bad enough. Parsons and this guy, and I'm trying to remember his name, he's not ever talked about. But this guy could mind bend people like Brother Jonathan. Madame Blavatsky was very influential, and her brand of, of mind bending was called Theosophy. You probably are familiar with that. Heard but, of it? Not familiar with it. Uh, it's uh, mind bending. Theosophy is something else, and today in these cults, they take snatches from Theosophy, from Scientology, and blend all this together with a little bit of yoga, especially the renegaded yoga called, uh, what's the yoga that... Uh, Transcendental meditation? or the, No, the, that's bad. That's another cult. It's the one where the monk tries to get the same sexual ecstasy of a woman by imagining a cobra riding along his spinal cord. 
That's uh, probably a little far out there for me. I'm not sure yeah, about well, that, that one. That, that, <laughs> uh, you've heard of this. You've heard of it. You just haven't seen, had it put in perspective like I just did. There are all sorts of things that they blend in together, and they'll mind warp somebody that is vulnerable to this so easily. They'll never be the same. And they pull them in, and they can actually make these people into slaves. I mean, they can do it, and it doesn't take long to do it. But they engender a sense of misplaced devotion, and then they convince, then they use fear. But they will pull them away from all their loved ones. They will commit them to doing whatever they want them to do, and eventually they become organized criminal activity. The Illuminati is an organized criminal activity. It's a two-million-person private army of the Rothschilds, always has been. And these people infiltrate anything and everything, even our Supreme Court. If people understand that there are so many things worse than a 33rd degree Mason going on on the planet right now, they begin to appreciate that there's far more complexity. And they'd start looking for what is the red mass, which is attended by all the key politicos in Washington, D.C. every year in Washington, D.C. The New York Times used to report when this was going on, but they don't anymore. You know, it, it, they almost got Barney Frank. Do you even remember who Barney Frank was? Oh, yeah, the lisping guy. Yeah, they almost got him. This was something that was broken by the uh, the Washington Post. I think this happened back in the 80s. It had to do with that Boys Town thing. Yes. Where they, they were shipping young boys and, and young girls. Child uh, trafficking. In, yeah. Into D.C. for the pleasures of the elite. And apparently one of the uh, the houses where these uh, parties were held was a, a townhouse in Georgetown. It was owned by Barney Frank. Now, somehow, somehow he avoided prosecution. But that actually did take down a few big names. I don't think that it went up nearly as high as they could have gone if they'd really wanted to. Never does. Never does. Uh, but yeah, I think they threw us a bone and gave us some of the middle managers uh, with that one. A guy I knew at that time who happened to run in that crowd told me some horror stories that, you know, again, it was stuff that I would prefer not to know. I mean, there are yeah. some things that you just really don't want to know. But these houses where these parties were thrown were wired up with every kind of surveillance gear you could possibly imagine. And if you were the fledgling congressman who just came in from, you know, you just got elected and you, you heard about this cool party where you could go and, you know, you'd get drunk and, you know, maybe there'd be a few lobbyists there that would slip a few hundred bucks in your pocket or something. And all of a sudden you got, you know, little girls and little boys available and, you know, you something's been put in your drink. And next thing you know, they got pictures of you with goats and donkeys. And you are owned. That's the game that's played. If you wonder why this uh, uh, Republican that everybody thought, you know, the, the conservative who was on the Supreme Court, uh, he's some kind of Knights of Malta guy, uh, Rogers, I think is his name. You know, everybody was counting on him to blow Obamacare down, and they were absolutely blown away when he came out saying, oh, yeah, this this is pretty Matter of fact, I think he wrote both sides of the argument on the thing. He wrote both the pro and the con argument. But, yeah, everybody was just absolutely blown away because they just knew he was going to blow this thing out of the water and, and, and call it unconstitutional. Apparently, he has such predilections, and he was uh, called to task. You better vote the way you want, we want you to vote, or, you know, some things might get out. You know, your recorded phone calls with uh, Susie's sex line or whatever. Who knows? That is how dirty these guys play. And the reason... Yeah. The government does not work for us is because, by and large, we're decent people. We don't look for trash on other people. And when we see it, we just, we're so shocked. It shocks our sensibilities so much that we would prefer not to know. There are those out there who take full advantage and make sure that any such minor transgression, and it can be something minor. You know, I mean, this guy, he just got blown out of New York. He was going to be the comptroller of New York. What's his name? Wiener. Okay. He liked high class hookers, you know. Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> compared to little boys, I mean, I'd give the guy his oh, hookers I, if, he, I know. If, he, if he was a good politician and he, he was working for the people. You know, it's a private transaction between two consults, consenting adults. That's one of those things where you know I can turn my back on that and pretend it doesn't exist if he's doing a good job. Uh, but they used it on him because he wasn't 
towing the line that they expected to be towed and uh, it ruined his political career. Okay. But, you know, <laughs> the ones who surprise you and vote for stuff that you never would have expected them to vote, you just wonder, what have they got on that one? Well, this this brings up another reason why the monsters would want to create homeless, because that is the perfect market to get these children from. Well, that it makes it vulnerable. I've got a base of operations here, okay? Now, that is both a benefit and it's a hindrance. It makes me afraid to lose my base of operations. So if I was threatened with the loss of my base of operations, I might do something that I might not otherwise do to try and keep it. Yeah. Now, if I no longer had my base of operations, that would be a shame because I, you know, I would not have access to all of my various conveniences. But to some degree, there is a certain amount of freedom associated with that. And that now I am free to do whatever I damn well please. And if I wish to, you know, extract vengeance on those who took away my base of operations, uh, at that point I got nothing to lose. You know, I think Gerald Saletti said it best, you know, when people have nothing left to lose, they lose it. And, you know, (laughs) yeah, I can see both sides of that coin. Don't get me wrong. You know, I'm, I'm not going to purposely become homeless just to see what it's like. I know what it's well, like. I, it's not I real know. comfortable. I know, but if you're not materialistic enough, they can get no handle on you. They can't corrupt you. They have tried on me repeatedly over my life. And the last time they shared with me something that told me that the offer was genuine, I didn't uh, actually believe it because it looked like one of these email hoaxes. And then they sent me a picture of the Supreme Seven, the seven justices on the Supreme Court that are Illuminati, to try to entice me by showing me how far and how entrenched the Illuminati's influence was. They thought that would make it just so appealing to me. Well, it just did the opposite. And, of course, they had a rider on it that I wouldn't show it to anybody and all that. Well, that's the first thing I did was share it. <laughs> Safer if you do. We've all been tempted. We've all been tempted. I mean, I, I had keys to the executive washroom and a secretary and corner office and all that good stuff. And, and you know, I, I did a lot of things during that period that made my teeth itch. But I had a line. I had a line that I would not cross. And the people who run these big corporations, they'll use incrementalism on somebody like me. They knew I have that never I had already a, called that before. They, they knew I had a line in the sand because every time they would ask me to do something that made my teeth itch, I would look my boss right in the eye. And I said, you know, that is real close to crossing my line. And he'd, he'd shake his head and he'd say, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know, but it's got to be done. It's got to be done. And you're the only one who can do it. And I'd say, okay, I took the man's paycheck. You know, this is why they call it work. And I would do the dirty deed. And then, uh, you know, he'd ask me to do something that was just a little bit closer to the line. You know, and they'd step right up to the line. And, you know, eventually they came to me and they wanted me to do some stuff that was just outrageous. And I looked at my boss and I said, you know, that's it. You've crossed the line. I cannot do that. Now, it's on you. You know, I, I serve at your pleasure. I can pack my desk up and be out of here within 20 minutes. And he said, pack your stuff. And I was out of there. I walked away from a quarter of a million dollar a year job. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people out there, quarter million dollars, who do you want me to kill? But I, <laughs> yeah. I, I had a line that I would not cross. And when they crossed that line, you know, that's it. Yeah, okay. I, yes, in the past I have done some things that were kind of borderline. They were kind of sleazy, and I didn't really appreciate you asking me to do such things. But, you know, they were not illegal, and nobody was harmed. So, you know, I, I have a line that I won't cross. There's a certain moral point where you cannot push me beyond that point. When they push beyond that point, ain't no fancy job, ain't no secretary with big titties and, uh, and corner office that's going to buy my morality well you know when you said incrementalism i'm thinking of what we used to call it when we were back in the 60s we called it co-option you remember yep. that yep. and uh, uh, i checked out all the organizations going on at the time you remember the sds 
Yeah, I was. Uh, Students for a Democratic Society and how it got infiltrated. If you went for, to one yeah, of their for about meetings, twenty minutes for about twenty minutes, I was a member of the SDS. Well, if you went to one of the meetings and you sit down and looked around, I will guarantee you half those people were FBI or CIA. <laughs> it wouldn't them, surprise me. I'm not kidding you. You know about the American Communist Party. Half those people were FBI. If you went to one of their meetings or something. I never did because I wasn't that old. But having read what I have about uh, so many of the hearings that went on under the McCarthy era, because of all the witnesses that came forward that were FBI, you knew that they had to be at those meetings, right? (laughs) Yeah. Back in those days, I was never much of a joiner. I was really never much of a joiner. And I I did attend a couple of SDS meetings because, you know, it seemed like these guys were really trying to get their act together and, and, and and actually do something. Like I say, I was, I guess I was a member of the SDS. I don't think I ever got a club card or knew the secret handshake, but I think I was a member for about 20 minutes. About the only group I involved myself back during those times, there was a very small, group of Black Panthers in the Washington metropolitan area who are organizing protests uh, on behalf of the Black Panthers in, uh, in the Washington metropolitan area. And I think there were seven members of the Black Panthers. That's how big and, and scary this organization was in the Washington, D.C. area. The, yeah. and it, was, it was seven big black guys and, and one funny-looking white guy with a ponytail on a motorcycle. <laughs> well, you know, there was a criminal element to the Black Panthers. Well, there's a criminal Most element of them- anything. Yeah, most of them were idealistic. Most of them were very civic-minded, and they, they weren't going to take any crap anymore. They were not going to be pushed. You know, they had been pushed right up against the wall. There was no place for them to run. Yeah, they were going to fight. Guess who used to defend the criminal element of the Black Panthers and made a name for herself doing oh, so? Oh, I, I know who you're talking about, the uh, Jewish guy. Uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Oh, I no. guess. Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton? Oy. That's right. Oi. Uh, Hillary I, guess, I wouldn't yeah. have thought. I thought it Kunstler. I thought it was Kunstler. No. Kunstler, I, I thought, got, got a, a... Compared did, to did. Hillary Clinton, Kunstler was an okay guy. But Hillary Clinton got in thick with the darkest element of the political machine by doing that. This is before she got involved with Bill Clinton. That's how she became noticed as a good candidate for the machine. <laughs> you know, certain amount of soullessness. Yeah, you can see it in her eyes and her ankles. <laughs> How do you know about that, do you? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I have uh, a theory yeah, was... about small-handed men too. Men that have small hands. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course, that's, that's, a that. that's a bias. Of mine yeah, see, that's a bias of mine. That's a bias. You're being prejudiced now against uh, people. I, with... I am. I am. Yeah. I try to admit my prejudices, at least those. I don't have any prejudices against the people of different races. I don't have gender prejudice or anything, but I have prejudices against men with small hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, exactly. Well, you know, it's funny. You know, I I would like to think that I am not prejudiced, but I tell you, I am becoming more and more convinced that there is a war on right now against white people, and it's. Very discouraging to me because even though, you know, I, I, I'm such a Heinz 57 variety mix, it would really be hard to figure out exactly where my genetic code lies. I mean, there is a little bit of, uh, a North African Moor in me. There is some Native American in me. You know, I, I am such an American Heinz 57 mutt that it, it, it's hard for me to owe allegiance to a given race. But, you know, people who look at me will say, okay, well, he's, he's a white guy. You know, he, he passes for European. Okay, well, that's fine. All right, so I pass for European. But, I, you know, I do have a good bit of European blood in me. And I can tell you that right now there does seem to be some kind of a, a hell-bent war. Well, we, we are not reproducing. Less. Our race is not reproducing. We are being out-reproduced by the other races. What lands we have been able to conquer from the other peoples of the world is surely being conquered from us, and we're doing nothing about it. I mean, shoot, at least the American Indians put up a fight. We're not even putting up a fight. Well, the last confirmation to the Supreme Court was Sotomayor, who is a Latino. When she was up for confirmation, it came out that she had made the statement in public that all white men should be castrated. 
So that's the element that they want on the Supreme Court. That amplifies your point, doesn't it? In a way, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, I wish I could put my finger on one event, but I think you just gave it to me. <laughs> well, that's a good representation. It's what we call in poetry a euphemism, a good euphemism. You know, I don't want to be aligned or allied with these uh, crazy tattooed uh, skinhead types. I don't identify with those people. But the fact of the matter is, I understand why they're concerned. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, yeah, the, the white race is under pressure right now, a lot of pressure. Have you figured out what Operation Fast and Furious was for? At first, I thought it was all about getting an excuse together to, to once again, you know, come after, you know, average Joe for his guns. Then I figured, okay, there are competing drug factions in Mexico and our boys are arming the drug dealers that they prefer to do business with. You know, at this point, that whole mess has become such a confusion to me. I don't know. It's, it's not confused. You know that the Border Patrol in Arizona twice confiscated hordes of these weapons. Now, this was before anything was ever mentioned or before Fast and Furious came up in the public eye because this was secretly going on years before Fast and Furious was even considered to exist. All these weapons were coming back from Mexico in the United States and being hoarded on a ranch at this gang, the preferred drug gang in Mexico, the one that uh, is most powerful, had the been furnished. Are assholes, yeah. yeah, well, they're bringing them back here. They were being supplied these weapons by the government, by our government, by our attorney general. Uh, if they were being supplied these weapons and they were going to Mexico, why were they bringing them back over here? And I'll tell you why. Because they want to get our soldiers out of this country so that when they start their martial law crap, and go house to house, search and seizure operations to take not just your guns, but your stored food, your stored water, everything else that in any way could sustain you through the hard times coming, the famine coming. They're going to use these Mexican thugs that they have armed that are gang members and so forth, along with Blackwater, along with other people, mercenaries, uh, UN people or whatever that they've got secretly billeted in different bases across the country. That's who they're going to use because these people won't think twice about shooting down American civilians. And they don't have to worry about their loyalties like they do American soldiers. This is what is behind Fast and Furious. I was wise to it. I was in a cheaper-than-dark gun store. It's not far from where I live. And this was like three years ago before there was any mention of Fast and Furious. And I was in there, and there were all these uh, legal aliens that couldn't speak a word of English, and they're looking at all the AR-15s with the 100-round double drum clip, all this stuff, and they were making these lists. And they had this one guy that could speak English, who was Mexican too, but he could speak English, and he was working out when they were going to pick him up. You know, it was so obvious, and I was kind of going up and saying, watch this, watch this, you know. They were all looking, their eyes were wide open to that, because that was just patently illegal, but they were doing it, weren't they? And, of course, I'll bet you that that guy was either under that program, or he was DEA or ATF. You know, they work for the other side. They don't work for American people. They'll take your guns in a heartbeat, whether you have them legally or, or not. And they will frame you. They will do anything. I know people that have been selling their guns at gun shows and stuff that they come in. And just because they can confiscate them without any grounds and arrest these people without any grounds and get away with it and intimidate everybody else that is sitting there watching, they do it. But they don't do it as much at the big gun shows like one in Tulsa that they have every year because of people getting fed up with that stuff. A lot will get their brains beat out. When it comes right down to it, I don't think anybody in the United States really wants to have to go to war against no. their government. You know, it, 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 it take them on in a head-on assault. I don't think you're going to make it. Now, if it's got to come down to it, if it just has to come down to it and there ain't no other way, I'm thinking black pajamas, straw hat, and a bicycle. 
I think I'd do the Viet Cong bit because, uh, you know, th- those boys knew how to put up a sustained resistance against a superior force. There are lessons out for, for those who, you know, just you, you can't can carry see any other way. You can carry 300 pounds of rock on a bicycle. Yep. There is a method to the madness for those who just, you know, want to throw their hands up and say, oh, there ain't no way. Yeah. Yeah, the United States has had its ass kicked before. Well, you know, by a little you know, guys have, in, in pajamas with bicycles. They have anticipated that. That's why all the national parks in this country are under the administration of the UN. <laughs> they don't want us to have any hinterland by which we could form an effective opposition and practice guerrilla warfare on their treasonous asses. They don't have the storm sewers yet. <laughs> no, no. Well, you know, you know, the thing is, if you sustain the resistance very long, what do snakes do? If you pick up a rock and you suddenly hit them, what do they do? I'll tell you what, no one is more vulnerable than in a hole in the ground. And why do I say this? And I hope they're listening. Because they've got to have their air buffer, don't they? That air buffering system has to be open, doesn't it? Not anymore. They can actually recycle their air now. The Russians perfected that technology about 20 years ago, and I'm sure that, that the Americans have done it. That's only good for a limited amount of time, and they need more than a limited amount of time to survive. You know, and they'll, they'll find a calcium carbonate deposit under there. Boys, the terrible thing is, is I know some terrible things. Oh, God, I know some terrible things. And sometimes it scares me the things I know. I keep wondering, you know, if this nation ever degenerates to a scenario kind of like what was depicted in Mad Max, I know what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be that midget down in the pig poop making methane because, you know, I know too many things. Uh, But, you know, an outcropping of calcium carbonate, I will get you all the oxygen you need to breathe. Plenty. Yeah. It's it's too easy to do. Calcium carbonate, urinate on it. You got oxygen. Well, there are different ways, but I'm going to tell you something. The implementers don't like the elite any more than you and me. What, their check bounce? (laughs) No, I'm telling you, they're not stupid. And they know what's in store for them when history is to be rewritten. And so uh, I'm telling you that the elite haven't caught on to that. Half of the elite already believe some myths that just aren't true. And they're fed that by their so-called captains and lieutenants who don't like them any more than you and I like them. So you think they might be being set up? Yes. I know they are. And I know that Israel has been set up, too. Israel's got to fall. I mean, there, there's no way those boys can survive. If they make their peace with the Palestinians and in that Gaza ghetto, that Warsaw ghetto that they it, have in it'll Gaza. It'll never happen. It'll never no, happen. No, it won't. The, because, the Israelis because have become their own worst nightmare. You got and, it. They you know, have. They're not going to let go of that. They are not going to let go of that. When, they think when you're in the right. When you're a tiny little target, you better treat your neighbors better than they do. And I'll tell you, I know some things that I just don't want to share with them because I don't like them that much. But they are a lot more vulnerable than they know. James, I don't know about you, it's 1 o'clock in the morning here, man. I'm getting tired. Well, gentlemen, it was my pleasure to have had a show with you, Gary. I, my pleasure to have met you, yeah, and I enjoyed it very we covered much. covered a lot of ground. We really did cover a lot of ground. I want to thank you, James, for hosting this. And Gary, I want to thank you for being here. And I think we ought to do this a little more often, James. Well, it was improvised. And I thank you for the opportunity because this is a very important issue to bring up. And I hope people get on it and let us know what they find out. And if we do any follow-up on this, they can report to you what they find out. And maybe we can even have somebody on the show that can vouch or verify for something that we brought up about these disappearing homeless. This is a concern we need to all share because we could be next. We could be homeless next. And thanks to all the listeners because without you... We wouldn't have a reason to be here. We'd be sitting here talking. That's right. The listeners make it. You're listening to Wolf Spirit Radio. 